Yeah. Welcome everyone to Ladder Daily Digest. We honor creators and we are bringing in a TikTok creator, Rob Tobler. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. And joining me is the lovely Debbie Donovan. Hi. So Rob, we'll start out with um, just start up sort of like a life sketch, like we're, we're putting you, we're planting you in the ground later on today and just want to know about your life. What you'd want to be said at your funeral, right? <laughs> where did you come you from, and where are you going? That's, That's right. Where, I want the guy at, the, at my funeral to give a eulogy and say, "Look, he's moving." <laughs> That's right. <laughs> no, my room, uh, my Mormon roots are planted pretty deep. I'm a descendant of pioneer ancestors. John Stuckey, a pioneer and polygamist. Uh, was my great 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 grandfather his story of crossing the plains has been told in general conference several times uh but my family i ended up growing up in um, sandy utah in the willow creek area and then in middle school my dad pulled a um kind of a lehigh on us he had a vision and decided that we needed to move to nebraska leave the land of our inheritance and so i grew up in uh, omaha area which was really good for me because um in utah it seemed like it didn't matter what kind of a Latter-day Saint I was, but in Nebraska, I really had to choose to either commit or just drop it. And I chose to commit to, to the faith. Uh, so I was, you know, seminary president, quorum president. Uh, but most of all, I just wanted to get a testimony. People around me were claiming to have had spiritual experiences, and they were saying that they had a testimony, but I could not get it. And were the you reading the Book of Mormon as a, as a teenager? I had read the Book of Mormon 13 times by the by the time I got to the MTC, uh, but could not get a testimony of it. It was very frustrating to me. Also, little things were coming up, and I was already starting to build this little shelf. I remember two of the things were I came to my dad, and I said, why can't we pray to Jesus if he was the Jehovah of the Old Testament and people prayed to him? And heck, Joseph Smith prayed to Jehovah during the Kirtland Temple dedication. Why can't we pray to him? I also have the question of why doesn't the Sermon of the Mount, a Sermon on the Mount in Third Nephi, match the Joseph Smith inspired translation of the Sermon on the Mount in the Bible? And I could not get decent answers for this. So I'm building my shelf and I'm trying to grow that testimony. And by the time I went on a mission, I really think I only had a testimony of one thing uh, fasting. Uh, I had done a lot of it, it, uh, it during the repentance process. And it seemed to have strengthened me, and I found power in it. But that got me on a mission. Where And where'd you go? I went to Mendoza, Argentina, up against the Andes Mountains, a very a lot like Salt Lake City, high desert. Um, Snow and, on, the, on the hilltops, the mountaintops. Yes. Uh, in fact, in the mission boundaries is where the, um, the uh, story of um, – Alive, where the rugby players crashed and had to survive on human flesh. So, yeah, snow-capped mountains year-round, but 110 degrees in the valley. Um, so I learned to love the Argentine people. I learned to love Spanish. Uh, I learned to love serving. I did not learn to love my mission president. I thought I would, but I had three of them. They each kind of came in with contradictory plans and rules. And the, the one that I had the longest, his name was President Verdugo. He was from Chile. And in Spanish, Verdugo means executioner. And he was <laughs> brutal on us. I remember we had we would set mission goals for how many baptisms we would have. And when we set new records for baptisms, but we didn't quite reach the goal, he would simply just say, you owe the Lord 25 souls. Go to work. You know, uh, we, we were sometimes not allowed to call home on Mother's Day or Christmas if we didn't reach our goals. And so, again, I'm adding things to my shelf. It, it was very, very difficult for me. I also had experiences where um, during conversations with people of other religions, I didn't have an answer. And I know the scripture says you should be ready to give an answer to any man for why you have hope and, and faith. And so I got Catholic books, I got Jehovah's Witness books, and I became a real studier, you know, studying. There was one thing that my mission president did say that I did agree with. And he said that um, we, were, well, we were having problems with missionaries getting girlfriends. And so he would say, look, 
So he wanted to help you guys get girlfriends? No, no. He said Latinos with Latinos and Americans with Americans, you know, because he didn't like seeing Americans come back and marry Argentine girls, right? And that was the first time I said, you know, he's right about that. And I couldn't believe it. My my companions who never murmured or complained about any mission rules, they were like, how can he say that? If I find the right girl, I'm coming back, you know? I said, no, he's right about that. Which made it awkward when I got back to BYU and met my wife who is from Venezuela. And then I got an invitation to a mission reunion. I thought, I can't go to that. I'm, I'm, I can't bring you, you know? <laughs> That's right. Evidence you faltered from your instruction. Yes. Yes. Now, were, were you thinking, um, had you already read uh, Spencer W. Kimball's book that talked about mixed race marriages weren't any good and um, other things like that? Well, I'd read Mirror Girl of Forgiveness, uh, you know, of course, because the bishop had given me that to read. Uh, and I knew that interracial marriage was a sin, but I kind of thought that was only for like African American, I mean, Africans with, with white people or whatever. So, so in reading the miracle of forgiveness, was that part of on your mind that it was against God's law to uh, mix races? Well, I think that was a confusing item that I just had to add to the shelf. I mean, the Book of Mormon seemed against the mixing of, of those two races and Did you receive any pushback from your family or was it more just the influence of your mission president that kind of put that in it? Actually, actually, you know, uh, interesting. So I came home from college, told my uh, parents that I thought I had found the right girl and that I was going to get engaged. And they said, we didn't know you were dating. We'd like to meet this girl. So flew her out for Christmas. My parents fell in love with her, helped me buy a ring. But then when she flew home, they said, you know, um, the prophet does recommend that you marry someone within your same religion, race, socioeconomic, you know, to avoid problems in the marriage, which, yeah. But in my stake there in Nebraska, uh, there was a BYU blast basketball player, uh, Chapman, I forget his name, but he was African-American. His wife was white. I thought, yeah, looks like it's okay. So hmm. That's press good. forward. That's good. Yeah. So That's did you end up going to the reunion or did you? Stay home. I did not go. I took it out. I took it out. <laughs> Plus, I didn't really have a good relationship with that mission president for so many reasons. So, skip it. Was he like that with a lot of the elders? Did you notice, or were you unique in your perspective of like this guy? I don't care for. He was. He, he was like that with everybody. He would uh, come up with rules like um, he would say, "You can't read marvelous work and a wonder, Jesus the Christ." Uh, Truth restored. You're only allowed to read the scriptures and preach my gospel. Send your books to the mission office. And I said, I've got to learn from the first presidency telling me to bring these books. How are you overriding their revelation? I, I just, it was so confusing. Um, he, mm -hmm. he petitioned the first presidency to allow him to send missionaries home if they did not have a baptism in three months. So I was running scared all the time, what? just hustling, hustling for the Lord. <laughs> Did, did you think oh you were gosh. like in the land, the Lamanites? Well, yes, I did, of course. I was I was teaching the Lamanites in their life. Mm -hmm. From did their you, book. Did you feel did like you they any... were... Go, oh, ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, were, they res were, were, the, were the people responsive to the Mormon faith? Was it something that they you found easy to convert and convince people to baptize? Or was it a hard sell? Uh, I think it, they were generally agreeable to, especially since they were Catholic, they were agreeable to talk. And if their situation was that they needed friends or they had been through a crisis or they needed community, uh, they were, you know, smothered in love when they went to church. And I remember I baptized a guy who was a, a lawyer and a karate instructor. And halfway through his conversion process, he says, hey, wait a minute. How come it talks about horses here in the Book of Mormon? I always was taught in school that the first introduction of horses to America were from the conquistadors. And my answer about, well, in the La Brea tar pits, there's tar, uh, horse bones, did not satisfy him. Of course, they're from the wrong place and time. Yeah. But, um, but he had a dream that uh, 
was meaningful to him. And so he disregarded that concern and got baptized anyway. So we had a lot of success down there. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So, so moving along, uh, post-marriage uh, and post-BYU, I joined the U.S. Air Force and bounced around the country, Oklahoma, Texas, ended up in Florida for quite some time. And in Florida, I discovered Mormon Radio, which was podcasts that the church was putting out online. So you could listen to the Inside Magazine, the scriptures, obviously, but they also had channels like History of the Hymns, and it would explain how a hymn was written or uh, Faith in Every Footstep. They would even have, they had a channel where they interviewed mission presidents coming back. And I just devoured anything I could get my hands on from the church. And that became a lifelong pattern of learning whatever I could about the church and its history and its gospel. Was I that left around the, the year 2000? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and so, oh, by the way, uh, the, the world of podcasting was just coming about. And after I finished listening to the Insign and all the other churches' radio channels, I said, oh, wait a minute, here's another one, Mormon discussions, uh, Mormon stories. Uh, you know, and so I really enjoyed listening to interviews with Richard Bushman and other people, uh, and it became a, a lifelong habit. I left the Air Force and moved to Washington State. And two really important things happened, well, three really important things happened there. One was um, my wife bought a trampoline from a gentleman on Craigslist. And he and her began to correspond via email, and he started sending her all this anti-Mormon material. And she was not the least bit interested, but I was the word mission leader. So I'm like, yeah, let's have this conversation. Let's go. And so for the next three years, he and I, I became an apologist as he and I emailed back and forth his questions about the church. These were not actually his questions. These were some well-researched, tough questions. And I was learning things I didn't know anything about. Um, and I was learning how to be an apologist, right, for the church. Right, because you were thinking, if this information is out there, we're going to have to defend it somehow. Exactly. And so, you know, Fair Latter-day Saints, Fair Mormon, they were starting up. Sometimes they had resources that would help me. There were online forums. And I really enjoyed digging deep into the scriptures and answering his questions. The second thing that happened in Washington is that um, my wife um, be, uh, volunteered and be, became an extra in the church's Bible videos that they were making about Jesus's life. These are the short little vignette videos that they filmed in Goshen, mm -hmm. Utah. Because she has the skin complexion that looks a little Middle Eastern, she and my children were in like 13 different uh, scenes. And this is While about they, 10 years ago? Yes, or more. Okay. She, in between filming, she found herself on set in the garb, having a chat with the actor playing Jesus. And she came home to Washington and told me about this experience. She says, I really felt inadequate and I couldn't keep eye contact. It was so real. She says, I don't ever want to feel uncomfortable or unworthy in any way to be in the Lord's presence. So she starts this deep dive studying Jesus's life. She wants to know everything and she wants to have a strong, close relationship with him. The third thing that happened in Washington was that my kids got into trouble. They got into trouble at school. Uh, the state of Washington was legalizing marijuana. Um, members of my family were sexually assaulted. There was involvement in the criminal justice system. And so we threw ourselves into counseling, priesthood blessings, fasting, prayer, anything to save these kids. Uh, I, I had a job in the, I think I was a seminary teacher or a executive secretary in the state presidency at the time. And we made the, the tough decision after rehab after rehab to give our kids a fresh start. I quit my job, we sold our house and moved to Hawaii. Uh, a geographical relocation does not solve a person's underlying issues, but at least the kids had a new school, new friends, and uh, eventually lots of, things. Lots of beaches, beaches. The weather was good. The scenery was good. Yeah. So, so, so what was it like living in Hawaii? Hawaii is awesome <laughs> if you can afford it. <laughs> and so we had to pick up like five side hustle jobs just to afford it. Uh, but the people are great. The weather's great. Come and on over. Did you have to change careers? 
No. So I, uh, I was an air traffic controller in the Air Force, and I did find employment here doing the same. Okay. So that was really good. So not a lot of instability. And did you get a degree at BYU? Yes, Spanish. And, well, you, language. Mm -hmm. So you like you tested out of like 15 units of Spanish, and then you just kept on going? And that's exactly why I did it. It was the quickest way to graduate and get a commission mm -hmm. into the Air Force officer. So I was like, oh. what do I got to do to get out of here? I just want to get on with, with life. So. Strategy. Right. Well, I'm, I'm curious because you grew up, A, not in Utah bubble and kind of had that experience of having to choose your level of faithfulness. Did you find that the military was more supportive as far as being a family support, a unit or and community, or was the church more of the backbone and community that you relied on as you were raising your kids and moving about? Well, I would say the church has always been the, the foundation, the backbone, the support system. But it's a lot like the military. You know, the military mm -hmm. offers you military housing, a hospital, a grocery store, a job, um, a sense of purpose. And there's a lot of similarities there. So I remember seeing something where military garments could be like, uh, what do you call it, camouflage or other colors. Did you have experience any of that? I had some light brown, kind of brownish color. And under your camouflage uniform, when you're changing in the locker room with guys, it, it it's just becomes a non-issue. Yeah. Yeah. So that was the first time I thought differently of garments when I saw that the armed forces had camouflage ones. But I was, I was thinking, well, I guess God doesn't want Mormons getting shot at by snipers. <laughs> so that's a very you're good wearing reason. this white flag. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Shoot here where you see the yeah, yeah the exactly. You might my eternal smile. <laughs> and, I, and I only oh, rethought of that to, lately because of the new garments that are uh, apparently going on sale for African members. They have a sleeveless, sleeveless garments that are going on. Were you wearing Hot this, Debbie? Climate only. Yeah. No, only oh, I, I just found out, but I'm like, really? I lived in Vegas for how many years and Arizona where it's 120. I think I should have had those a long time ago. <laughs> I think we well, could I just didn't hear your prayers. It, we could make some money if mm -hmm. we took a trip to Africa, bought up a bunch of these things, brought them back to hap, you know, Utah and sold them at a mm -hmm. big markup. I think they would sell. The underwear so. underground. <laughs> yeah. Right. We have yeah, black so. market garments. <laughs> <laughs> So your wife had this experience doing the um, shows and did that get her connected? Did, did they call her back sometimes for other productions later because of that? Yes. Experience? And in fact, when the church decided to make the Book of Mormon videos, uh, a lot of them were filmed here on the island of Kauai, Hawaii, where we live. And so they were looking for someone who had some experience and she became like the lead point person. So she recruited hundreds of ex she, she did firesides she recruited hundreds of extras members and non-members alike uh, polynesians hawaiians who who had the look and uh she encouraged our whole ward to you know grow their hair out and get beards and stuff for the be ready for the filming and that was actually a really positive experience mm -hmm. but it's like a live living, action uh road show <laughs> it's better than a road yeah. show <laughs> Yes, if, if we're not going to do road shows, we should keep making movies and let people participate. So, so how many years did you have long hair then? Okay, well, we'll get to the long hair thing in, in, in okay. later in my story, but I just grew a beard at that time. Okay. But it was really, they had to color it dark because they had to color my skin dark too to make, to make me fit. I actually got to participate in those ones. The Alma Almulek. Alma 34 scene, that's where my family's in, the, the uh, Book of Mormon ones. Yeah. But my kids continued to really struggle here in Hawaii. Uh, and as parents, we really struggled. So we continued counseling with our bishop, fasting, praying, priesthood blessings, therapy, um, couples therapy. And um, <laughs> one of Was our therapists. Family was, services, church, 
church sponsored therapy or just private? Not church sponsored. We did have one therapist who was a Latter Day Saint, and it was interesting. During one of our sessions, she turned to my wife and she said, "You know, I don't think you understand the atonement." And my wife, you could not have said a more hurtful thing to her. Uh, because she had been years just like, I want to know everything there is about this Jesus of Nazareth. And to hear that, like, you're failing, you don't get it, set her on a, she tripled down on her investment in understanding uh, the Savior. So, um, okay, so let's see. So Kids she was were- the first one in your family to be called a lazy learner. <laughs> yes, because uh, because of the, some of the things that I had been introduced to during my years of apologetics, I am now deconstructing and studying additional things on my own, and I'm in a lot of pain, but I'm not telling anybody. My children are in big trouble. My wife is struggling. I am not going to tell them about the, 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 the holes and the rotten wood in good ship Zion until I can find a better ship or something. So I was very alone just deconstructing as the seminary teacher. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Because as you are um, defending the church, you're also growing your shelves. Yes. Filling up rapidly. Right. And and, um, I'm learning a lot. I'm reading a lot of books um, and I'm adding things to my shelf. And then COVID hit. Hawaii's uh, COVID measures were very strict. And so we were away from the church for a long time. And I was actively setting up, we're going to do the sacrament. We're going to have a talk. We're going to have a song, you know. And my kids weren't really interested. And my wife was kind of, she was kind of deconstructing, but she was not informing me of that. She and I both read a very powerful book called Whom Say You That I Am by Judith and Joseph McConkie. Have you read this book? It's a historical Jesus book where we basically strip away all the spiritual aspects to him that he was the son of God, that he can forgive sin. And just look at him as a, as a person. Uh Evangelicals have written historical Jesus books. This is not a new thing, but this was a faithful LDS book. You can buy it at Deseret Book. And you learn things about Jesus that he, um, that when he is with an individual person, he is patient uh, and kind. And when he is dealing with an organization, he is impatient and angry, like a protester, you know. And we're learning about the way he treats women and the way he interacts with them. Very taboo, very, um, you know, good to women, right? So my wife is is adding these things to her mental picture and deconstructing, but she's not telling me anything. So then as COVID ends and we're now allowed to go back to church, she comes to me, and I'll never forget this. We were sitting in bed and she was she was almost shaking with nervous. And she says, I don't think I want to go back to church. And I was shocked. She's the most, you know, Molly Mormon dedicated person I've ever met. And I said, well, honey, you know, we, we all have issues with the church. I'm sure you can resolve this and find a way to, she says, do you have issues with the church? And I said, yeah, but I, I really don't want to talk about them. And she's like, like what? And I said, I, I really don't. And she's give me one thing. I said, okay, polyandry. She says, you mean polygamy? I said, uh, no, no, polyandry. And I had explained to her what that was. And when she heard that, she's like, well, that's not true. I said, yeah, it, it's true. You should look it up. <laughs> she says, is there more? I said, well, yeah, there's more, but I really don't want to mess with your faith. I don't want to share these things. She says, give me another one. I said, okay, uh, the book of Abraham. It's, you know, we have the papyrus and, and it was not a correct translation. What the scriptures show is not true. And... Um, Within three days, she resigned from the church, and so did all my kids. Wow, resigned. Wow. And I'm That's alone. mind-blowing. You guys are sitting there just. <laughs> what the heck? Oh, what do wow. I do, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, her courage, I really needed her as a partner because I needed to see that kind of courage. 
So I'm really grateful for her. She's the one you should be interviewing, really. But um, <laughs> so this really exacerbated my personal faith uh, crisis. And I would go to therapy and the therapist say, Rob, what do you want to talk about today? You want to talk about parenting? You know, you're, you've are you got a child in jail and you've got another child in big danger or whatever. Or do you want to talk about your marriage and some of the challenges being married? And I said, no. I said, I have got to talk about this faith crisis. This is killing me. And I mean, I couldn't sleep. I, I, that's when I grew my hair real long. I, I, could, I didn't want to eat. I was just suffering. And um, she said to me, the therapist said, you know, sounds like you need to find your own voice. Like for so long, you've been letting these church leaders do the thinking for you and determining what your values and morals are. Maybe you need to find your own voice. Now, I think what she had in mind was um, journaling or, <laughs> I don't know, blogging or something. And I, But I got the crazy idea, you know, maybe I ought to make a, an anonymous TikTok channel and just kind of get these feelings out. Uh, but, you know, I don't want to mess with my relatives or people in my words, so I'll just be real anonymous about this. And I, I titled the channel, President, Please Help Me. Because it was my last, I mean, my bishop, he couldn't help me. He'd never read the gospel topic essays. My parents, you know, they don't they don't know what the Joseph Smith papers even are. I've, I am alone. And this is my last ditch effort to like throw it out to the universe. And if somebody could get this to President Nelson, maybe he could address some of these things that are, you know, stumbling blocks for my faith. And my channel kind of took off. And I have made uh, 250 videos. And I would say the majority of them are not, you know, it's not me just grabbing my phone in my pajamas saying, uh, here's what I think. These were like Saturday Night Live crafted little skits with 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 music and sound effects. Um, because, and so in these uh, TikTok videos, if you've seen any of them, I dress up as Jesus, and I have interviews with Jesus. I I have interviews with Joseph Smith. I use some um, uh, animation software to do that. I I get to be a reporter, and I travel to hell, and I travel back in time, and I interview people. <laughs> we get to this see because I don't have a beef with my parents. I don't have any beefs with my bishop. It's Joseph Smith that I have some questions for. It's President Nelson that I need some answers from, and so I'm like, let's do this. Let's talk about this, you know. And in preparation for my discussion with you both today, I, I went through my TikTok channel and I've made over 250 videos and I noticed the, a trend. Um, the trend is that I start out, um, basically it, it, it's, it's the grief cycles what you're seeing. My early videos are me talking about the issues because I am confused, I am dismayed and I am ready to make some deals to save my faith and salvation. And then as I realize that no answers are coming, um, my hurt turns to anger. And I make a lot of uh, videos where I am very critical of how church leaders have handled uh, issues and been dishonest and gaslit me. And then in my last, I don't know, 100 videos, it's more about um, coming to terms, healing, connecting, community, um, so yeah, I made the TikTok channel for me to process and I, I don't mean to pull anybody out of the church or in the church. I've actually had a lot of people reach out to me in private messages, uh, that are somewhere in a faith crisis or a mixed space marriage. And I say, Hey, I'm here for you. If you want to stay in, I can help you find ways to nuance this and stay in. If you need help getting out, I can share things that'll help you get there, you know, and that's been meaningful to connect because, you know, in spite, of, in spite of the fact that I was the seminary teacher in my ward, nobody has bothered to care. Like nobody has reached out to say, hey, how, why aren't you coming to church? We heard your wife left. That must have been hard for you. And I have just felt so alone out here on this little island. So TikTok, the Exmo world became a really great community for me. Yeah. When was your first um, video? Oh, I was afraid you were going to ask that. It's, I don't know, probably a couple of years. Probably so, a couple of years, two or three years. Yeah. So the, the winter awesome. after COVID. 
Or was it a few months after that? It would have been a couple months after COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so it has been, uh, uh, oh, and then the, the last thing is, um, I kind of struggle with being authentic and genuine. And so my earlier videos, I did a lot of editing. I did a lot of retakes to make sure I looked good, you know, but in the, uh, in the last few hundred videos, I've really been able to be authentic and, uh, just say, Hey, this is me. This is, <laughs> this is what I really think. Um, but it's been a lot of fun. Now, one other thing that I wanted to bring up if, if this is helpful. So, you know, the therapy helped. I learned how to meditate. I learned how to, um, ex I, did, I ran a lot of marathons, went to a lot of therapy, but, and I did TikTok. All these things helped me, but I just needed a little bit more. Um, and so I did some research and decided to go do some plant medicine. And my wife and I took a trip to uh, South America and sat with some Shipibo shamans and uh, partook in ayahuasca, which was a game changer for me. Uh, wow. Yeah. Can I tell you about one of my I've heard that. I've heard that so many times. Yes. Tell me about it. Yeah, so I actually... So did you do like three nights in a row or something like that? I know that sometimes. Yeah, we we were there for a week and we did, I think, four ceremonies where we sat and did this. Okay, and I went down there to heal from uh, religious trauma and some, you know, some trauma, familial trauma. And um, and we partake of this this medicine out in this hut and the Shipibos begin their Icaros, their songs that they think creates a vibration which helps the, the the medicine work on your mind and um it seemed that the medicine was a lot smarter than me about what i actually needed i had a dream or a, a vision i that's what i would call it i don't think i traveled into any new dimensions or traveled in time or anything silly like that but in this uh, experience i was with um they call her mama aya the the feminine experience the, the feminine um feeling Sorry divine that, that guides you with this. That's why we chose that plant medicine, right? And uh, we're walking through a field and we get to this, this fence line and there's a gate and I, I cannot get this gate to open. And clear as day, the message came to me. She said, this is the gate of forgiveness. And until you learn this lesson, you will not progress any further. Oh, I wow. Knew, You're like, knew, man, like that's, that's awesome. what my intention should have been the whole time. But I, I really kind of chickened out and didn't want to address it. Um, so I quickly spouted off, okay, I forgive my dad. I forgive my son. I forgive my wife. Forgive. And the gate, the latch gets a little looser, but it's not opening. And she says, you'll have to do a little bit better. And so I vocalized some specific instances that were very harmful and hurtful. And I offered forgiveness and the gate comes open. It's a very narrow gate. And I have not yet bothered to look at how narrow the path. And as I look down, laying on the ground there is Jesus with his arms out. And there's no way for me to get through without walking on him. And I turned to her and I said, do you think he would mind if we, and she says, just ask him. And I look down and before I can even utter the sentence, he says to me, this is why I came. And so I walked across his body like a bridge to the other side of forgiveness and shed a thousand oh. tears. And it was a thousand uh, therapy sessions in one night. It was beautiful. And I had other experiences where I learned to, to uh, care for the inner child and soothe myself and, and things like that. And um, I'm not recommending this for everybody. You know, everybody talk to your doctor, do your own therapy. But for sure, if you ever consider something like this, please prepare yourself. Had I done this years earlier without the therapy, uh, you know, I probably wouldn't have gotten this much out of it. So, yeah. That's amazing. That's such a beautiful story. Wow. Talk well, about definitely <laughs> game changer. I mean, just as a, on a personal level, I can, I, I, that kind of healing, you're not going to get on your knees, I would say, <laughs> so to speak. I know, I know a lot of people, <laughs> 
they talk about forgiveness and it's not until they realize that they need to forgive themselves sometimes that they don't go all the way into, you know, the, the experience. Did you have a fear, feeling like that, like that you had to forgive yourself as well? Yes, because I had made a lot of mistakes in uh, parenting. I had had some very rigid beliefs. Uh, and so I was kind of a army style parent. And uh, that did not go well with my children's personalities. Uh, one other thing I do want to say about my kids, oh, by the way, anyone who, you know, someday my family will watch this video. We've ne I've never had a discussion with my parents, my siblings. I'm sure they'll find this someday. And so what I want to say to you is, if you thought my faith deconstruction or crisis was about my children, it most definitely was not. It was about the Joseph Smith papers. It was about the Book of Abraham. It was about polygamy. Um, it was about the Book of Mormon. Um, but there was one thing related to one of my children is that as I was listening to all these Mormon related podcasts, time and time again, there would be an interview with a LGBTQ uh, person. And uh, I had grown up during the McConkie, Boyd K. Packer, hardline LGBTQ era, and I absorbed a lot of those teachings. And so when another podcast would come up with an LGBTQ person telling their story, I thought, oh, come on, like, please, why do we, you know, this is a five hour, po but I would listen, I would listen. Unbeknownst to me, my daughter would be coming out years later. And so when she finally did, I was able to say, oh, okay, <laughs> which was a miracle and may have saved her life and for sure saved mine because had I not been forced to listen to the experience and story of the LGBTQ folks, um, it wouldn't happen. So I'm really grateful for, for that experience. Do you think that might have been a Mormon Stories episode then? Oh, I, yeah. Tons of Mormon Stories episodes with LGBTQ foes. And was, was there one in particular that you remember? Or like I remember watching Benji Swimmer's show and I remember mm -hmm. not necessarily thinking that I, you know, maybe as harshly as you were thinking, but I was thinking, oh, you know, a dancer, what do I care about a dancer <laughs> or a gay guy or whatever, you know, and yeah. just was, was able to feel for his story and understand a little bit more that people don't choose to be that way. You don't choose to like do, you know, something that flies in the face with all the teachings, you know, you don't choose to make your life so much harder. You know, it just, it just is how you are. Yeah. It, it took me years. It really took me. In fact, when I was a um, teenager in Nebraska, you know, I just was so excited about the gospel and we had the missionaries visit a lot. And there was a one missionary, this kid was just so cool. The way he did his hair, his ties. I just wanted to be just like him. I was 15. He's a 19 year old missionary. And I remember after we had dinner one night, we went outside and jumped on the trampoline, which was probably against mission rules. But as we were jumping, I said to him, I said, so uh, what did you do before the mission? And what are you going to do afterwards? He says, oh, well, I, I'm from California. I grew up in San Francisco. And yeah, I don't know what I'm going to do after. He says, when I was before my mission, we would it used to hang out on the weekends and we'd go around and beat up gay people. And that didn't feel right. But this guy was like my idol, you know. And I mm -hmm. thought, oh, okay, uh, you know, and, you know, I had been so indoctrinated by Packer, McConkie, and Kimball and others that that was an acceptable thing, an answer for me. And uh, I'm ashamed That's of it. That's right. Packer gave a talk in priesthood meeting about how some missionary was having a hard time and is like, well, what the, what's the problem? And he says, well, my, my companion, you know, wanted to kiss me, and so I decked him. And Packer was like, is that all? <laughs> said, well, somebody had to do it. Better you than the general authority. Right. So. <laughs> well, I have a question. Now that you, your whole family, which is nice, sometimes it doesn't happen that way, have transitioned out of the church. Have you found that your kids have been able to heal more or experience that kind of same level of, you know, because you can go to therapy and you, and I know what it's like to be a teenager who rebels and then has to make peace with that. 
do you feel like your kids are in a better place too without that burden of the, I call it a burden of the church or the faith or the dogma? Yes. Now, uh, leaving the LDS church did not solve all of our family's problems. My kids are not perfect. Mm -hmm. But the pressure cooker of worthiness and rule following and conditional divine love doctrine, when we took that off, our relationships with our children just skyrocketed and got better and their mental health got so much better. It was a total game changer for us and I'm so grateful for it. And my kids to this day, they, they cannot believe how much we have changed. Uh, yeah, our relationship with all of our kids is great. So that's awesome. So that, I love that. that part. Yeah. So your wife and your kids resigned. How did they do it? Well, they just went online, did the get a lawyer thing, get the notarized the thing. Mormon.com or, or .org or whatever it is. Probably. Okay. And, and I'm the only member of record to this day. Um, there you go. Yeah. I remember watching a Mormon stories, and I think it's a family in California. And they were talking, they were talking amongst themselves about maybe we should quit or maybe we shouldn't, you know, and this guy had been Bishop and they were thinking, you know, he, he's thinking, you know, how he's going to plan it, you know, to, to slowly back away from the church. And they were on a drive and his son is in the back seat and says, okay, I just quit. I just used my phone. And that's how easy, that's what you do. It's like, don't, don't like slowly pull don't complicate the needle it. out. Just <laughs> Rip the Band-Aid off, you know, I'm yeah. out. <laughs> and he was shocked, like, wow, you could do that nowadays just in a with a computer on a phone, you know, in your car. So anyway. Yeah, yeah I to this day, I still describe myself as a Latter-day Saint, just a, a devastated, heartbroken one because I wanted it to be true. I needed it to be true. I was desperate for it to be true. You know, you had been my, defending it. I wanted the eternal marriage. I wanted the family forever. Um, but as I learned critical thinking, a little bit of uh, how to biblical scholarship, learn how to look at the history, I it just so got you, overwhelming. You remain a member because mm -hmm. you think that just before Jesus comes back, polygamy will be restored. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's confession time. It's confession time. So, you know, <laughs> all the ladies, for all the women out there listening, when you're in a priesthood quorum and Doctrine and Covenants section 132 comes up and the issue of plural marriage or polygamy comes up, here's what happens in the elders quorum. You hear all the men give the right answer, which is, oh, I hope I'm glad we don't have to obey that anymore. I hope that never comes back. One wife is all I can handle. You know, that's the correct, the politically correct thing to say. And I, I think I was the only one guy in the room thinking to myself, dude, my wife, sweet. my wife is awesome. If I could clone her and there were two, three, I, I'm for this doctrine, you know? And so as I'm putting things on my shelf, I would examine polygamy and I, no, I don't want to put it on the shelf just yet. Uh, and finally, my shelf came crashing down when I got to read William Clayton's journals. He was Joseph Smith's right-hand man, scribe, and in his journals, we get to see a behind-the-scenes account of how polygamy went down. And, for example, um, you might recall William had married a woman. Uh, Joseph Smith encouraged him to uh, traffic and pay for a send for another woman. So now he was married to two sisters, and William says, hey, Joseph, can I marry the third sister? And Joseph comes to William and says, uh, no, I got a revelation last night that we're only allowed to have two women from any given family. Three would cause problems. So <laughs> you make her available for me. And I'm reading this saying, oh, this does not look good. Well, then William's second wife gets pregnant. And it appears this is going to be like the first polygamous child born in Nauvoo. And William's nervous. So he asks Joseph, what should I do? Joseph deliberates, comes back, and gives him an answer. And William writes in his journal, he says, if the high council brings you before me with charges, you know, I'll give you a, um, I'll give you a stern uh, 
rebuke, know, rebuke probably uh, cut you off from the church and rebaptize you. You'll be as good as new. Yeah, later on. So excommunicate you now, and then a little bit later, bring you back. Now, why? Now, why? Um, why was that a problem for me? I'd like. I wish I could say because it's disrespectful for women, which it is. But really, that was a problem for me because it just shows that Joseph Smith doesn't give a damn about the sacred name of Jesus Christ or holy ordinances. And he'll just fling them out as if they were a plaything to deceive the public and protect his butt. And that is deeply offensive to me. Uh, as I went through my TikTok channel in preparation for this discussion, I, I kind of kept Matt a tab of, how many of my videos were about polygamy? How many of them were about the book of Abraham? How many about, and the majority of my videos are about Jesus and me contrasting the Jesus of the New Testament with the Jesus of Mormonism and the stark contrast. And one of my, frust one of my frustrations with TikTok is that I used music in some of my earlier videos which then TikTok, when they renewed the copyrights, they didn't get rights to these songs. So they stripped the music out and ruined some of my videos. But I'm not bitter. No, but um, <laughs> one of my videos, <laughs> in one of my videos, I'm dressed up in a suit and tie and I'm standing in the church office building. And I say, you young men of the church, one day we'll be leaders in the church and you need to learn this important priesthood skill. And then I, I say, now stand with your feet, foot, you know, shoulder width apart, bend at the knees. And then I reach down and I, I grab an image of God, the father and Jesus, you know, and then the music starts and the lyrics of the song are throw them under the bus. And, and then you see a bus <laughs> coming up, throwing Jesus under the bus, because to me, that is the most offensive thing the LDS church leaders have done. Yes, they've lied to us about, yes, they've done naughty things with uh, uh, tithing. Yes, they've been racist and sexist and all this. But the way they have just um, taken their man-made mistakes and chalked it up to, well, Jesus made us do this, uh, he, you know, this LGBTQ policy that we had to flip three years later. That's right. God's was, ways yeah. are a mystery to us. Yeah, I, I, that was probably the, the thing that just the dagger in my heart. I'm like, I can't do this anymore. I, I respect him too much. So that's awesome. I think everyone should subscribe to your channel because I think it'll talk to a lot of people in and out of the church, but also on that fence, because that relationship that you have with God or you want to have with God, that is something that I think is innate in our human nature is that we want to find that divine, you know, or have something that's higher and bigger than us to to like know is out there. And it is so disappointing when the church has lied to you and you wake up and it's just that moment where you're like, I, I don't want to do this anymore. And I can't believe you you took something so special like Jesus or mm -hmm. like this divine person or God. And you basically turn it, turned it into the whore of Babylon. Like you really prostituted his name for profit, for power, for greed, for gluttony, like all those things that you look at and then you're like, oh my gosh, it is such a smack in the face, but you do it. And I think your channel, because I've watched some of your stuff, has, has been a great way to get that point out and to make it still like you can laugh, you know, you either cry or you can laugh. <laughs> we can cry about it or we can laugh about it. And mm -hmm. I think it's, I, I did a little stand up comedy at BYU and, um, and, and so I think I, I inclined toward comedy plus as a, as a male priesthood holder in the church, I was, I was taught how to be passive aggressive. And so I could use humor <laughs> to kind of pack a punch at, uh, you know, certain men who I think did us wrong in church history. And um, yeah, right. I'm hoping all seven people watching our show over the next week. <laughs> well, you know what? Like, they definitely love TikTok. And uh, that's the nice that's thing great. is that short form. It can. And we'll, we'll include in the description a few 
uh, uh, Rob's hits, we'll say. We can either do all the pinned yeah. ones. Your or, top 10 or something. Or you, you send Rob's me a few 10. that you think would be really good to link. in the. In Maybe the I, sh I should do that. In the comments, I should, should give you what are, I think, some of my top 10. Uh, and I'll include some very vulnerable, heartfelt ones and some just really funny ones. Uh, there was a one video where I dressed up as Dora the Explorer. And instead of singing the backpack <laughs> song, I talked about how the church likes to backtrack, backtrack. Um, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> on issues that, <laughs> That would be fun. Yeah. So Do your kids think ways. you're such an interesting cat now because you were such a serious diehard, you know, like, uh, 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 and now you're like the funny Mormon? I mean, come on. That's got to be. I, I think they're just a little bit embarrassed by me, you know, when they see me dressing up as <laughs> whatever they. <sighs> My latest character on TikTok is um, I am a member who got the calling as the trusted trans person bathroom escort. And so I, I carry a roll of toilet paper around and I I fulfill my calling. And um, anyway, my kids just probably laugh at me and try to. Film that. That's try. awesome. No, I love it. I, I love humor because it, it is, it, you have to, you have to find the humor and everything because I think it's the healer for sure. Yeah. And Rob, sure. do you want to talk about the future, the, the near future that's going to happen to you and what the current yeah, status so is? I actually uh, made an announcement. I took a five-month hiatus from uh, TikTok. Uh, I made a commitment to my wife and was encouraged by my therapist to just kind of give it a break, give a little more time to my the people in my life that are more important, I guess. Um, and I want to come back and um, and make more, not deconstruction, but more construction, how to live a fulfilling life, how to find peace and harmony, how to find meaning. Um, after a, a Mormon faith deconstruction. So that's my plan. Although I do have a list of some really funny uh, TikTok ideas for, you know, punching, uh, shining a light on some uh, very ugly uh, aspects of the Mormon church history and stuff like that. So it'll be a mix, but I okay. want to help. I like him. Right. So there'll yeah. be content that people can um, maybe be introspective and thoughtful about and and help them you know better their life instead of simply um commiserate maybe with uh the, the way the church has taught ta has uh, dealt with us we'll say yeah because i think that like when when two when a group of people are complaining about a common issue there's just a limit to how good of a bond and a community we can form uh, and I have been the beneficiary of a lot of healing, um, and I, I want to share that. And I think we can build a better uh, ex-Mormon community uh, with some of these spiritual tools and things like that. Has any um, of totally your former agree. has any of your former ward members um, spotted you and said, "Hey, I saw you on TikTok"? Nobody yet. It's just a not matter. Of the cat's not out of the bag. I know. I you didn't go to more. Ward dinners. Yeah, I I really miss my ward. I've gone to some service projects, and they were just kind of glad to see me, but nobody brought up the uh, the deconstruction or the TikTok channel. So okay, yeah. But when we see your TikTok channel on like Daily Mail, you're you know you can't hide anymore. <laughs> you know, it's funny because like viral I, or something. I spent so much time investing into TikTok, crafting these videos. And my wife would maybe complain a little bit that, hey, why don't you come help me do the dishes instead? Um, although I did make a TikTok video about that where I was doing the dishes and she's out tanning or something. And I say, hey, come help me do the dishes. Don't you remember your temple covenant? Obey your husband. She says, that got rescinded. And I said, dang, changing covenants. And then you hear her laughing. And I say, hey, no loud laughter. She says, they nixed that one too. You know. <laughs> But anyway, um, what was I mentioning? That um, yeah, I I can't. I feel very privileged in that uh, I'm not in a fixed mixed faith marriage. I don't have any children in the church that I need to kind of protect or be respectful of. I'm really in a privileged place, and so I've been mentored by good people. I've been access to therapy, and I want to give back. And so hopefully, when I get back on social media, it'll be a more positive guy, but I'm still going to try to be funny. So, I don't know if I'm funny or not, but apparently looks aren't everything. 
you know. So I think you're funny. I think it's a, I think it's a win. Maybe occasionally it's a great idea as a co-host for some if I have a guest on that has your interest. I would love to be invited back to co-host something because um, I am super interested in Mormon history, particularly early Mormon history, the pre-Book of Mormon history. I don't think we can understand the Latter-day Saint faith unless we understand Joseph Smith's treasure digging, which, which evolved into the magical thinking system and the imagined system that is LDS theology. So, so I like love- if I, get, uh, if I get Mark Elwood to come on the show, you'd like to be co-host for that? Sign me up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Mark Elwood, I wonder if I have his book anywhere. Um, you know, it is so interesting because when you when I had my faith crisis, I kind of went out and to look into the world of what other other people were doing, so to speak. And to then realize Joseph was really an occultist, it's kind of shocking. He's not like a a man of the Bible, you know. <laughs> oh, the glass looker. I, so yeah, I he said he wanted to come on my show, so I would love I to say you're the co-host to probably jump at the chance. Great. Let's do it. Let's do yeah. it. Thank you for your time. Such I appreciate fun. this invitation. This was fun. Yeah, thanks a lot. No, this I think was when super I fun. First, I think when I first um searched you out on Facebook and connected with you, it was like a month after you had started your TikToks, maybe two months. And um and and I hadn't even had a podcast or anything, but maybe when a year ago when I was starting my podcast, I was asking, Hey, do you want to come on? And you're still like, No, I'm kind of staying anonymous for now. Right. That's right. That's so right. Now, now it's the coming out party for Rob Tobler. Thank you for sticking with me. Hey, could I end on a bad note and leave you with my worst yes. LDS joke? Okay. Well, so when I got back from my mission, uh, I, I'm looking for a wife and it was daunting. So many, so many people. And my patriarchal best blessing gave me no clues about how to find a, this wife. So, but I had learned something on my mission which um, those of you who may have not served missions have not heard this doctrine, but if you have, you've for sure heard this, which is the harder you work as a missionary, the better looking your spouse will be. Your wife. Yes. So I'm, I'm now back at BYU. I'm dating a very nice lady. She says to me, hey, can we get together and talk? I said, sure. So we met at the park, sat on a bench, and she turns to me. She says, you know, Rob, I've been praying about this. I got my answer. We should get married. And I said, that can't be. I worked on my mission. I worked hard. This You're not pretty enough. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible. Terrible. Oh, that's a that's good a one. That's a bad one. No, but I actually just recently well, made a no, Go ahead. I made a TikTok video leaking the fact that mission presidents who have a visitor center they are being told that the, the sister missionaries in the visitor center need to stay there. Don't put them out in the field proselyting because they were specifically selected to enhance the image of the church. The boxes, the good looking missionaries, good girls, looking women. Yeah. The good looking sisters get to be at the visitor it's the center. Thing. Welcome to patriarchy. Didn't they call that like uh, flirting? Like the children of God, it was like fancy flirting to convert guys. They were flirt sending out all the pretty girls. Flirt, flirt to convert. <laughs> oh my goodness. No shame. I see that's the thing. That's right. No uh, shame. I thought Rob's <laughs> joke was going to be something about a door approach that he had been working on for, for getting a woman. <laughs> <laughs> I just lucked out that I conned somebody into marrying me, so... That's right. That's like why the Mormon's uh, dating span is really short, so you don't see any of the flaws in anybody, right? Exactly. Eyes closed, heart open, or something like that. That's right. Well, thanks, everyone, for watching. Thanks, Rob and Debbie. Um, everybody, like oh. and subscribe and do all the fun things to help grow the channel. And um, have a good rest of the year. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Uh, yeah.